Thank you for downloading this podcast from the British Theatre Guide. For more information about British Theatre Guide, please visit britishtheatreguide.info. Brian Murray, OBE, arrived in Manchester in the 1960s as the youngest artistic director in the country of the Travelling Century Theatre, remaining in the city to co-found the 69 Theatre Company, which went on to become the Royal Exchange Theatre, still one of the UK's leading regional theatres. Murray died in 2018 at the age of 75, six years after standing down as Artistic Director of the Exchange. But I spoke to him in 2012 when he had just announced that he would leave the theatre after directing the musical Wonderful Town in a co-production with the Lowry and Salford and the Halle Orchestra. I began by asking him whether he had mixed feelings about leaving the theatre he co-founded 36 years earlier. No, it's huge. And and actually, uh, it's 1968 when the 69 Theatre Company was formed, which then became the Royal Exchange Theatre. Then uh, it was at the University Theatre, now Contact Theatre. Yes, but the decision is right. It's, It's right for the company. The company is a group theatre, and the moment of going for the older artistic directors is always a very important moment. You try to go when the company is in a very strong position, which it is at the moment, with its artistic directors, Greg Herself and Sarah Frankham, and indeed our new executive director, Fiona Gasper. And also for me, I got quite old, <laughs> and your energies are different, and you simply want to use them for what you really want to do now, which is just direct, really and not take other responsibilities. I'm sure that in the year to come before I finally go, there'll be moments when I'm screaming, what am I doing, what am I doing? <laughs> but, it, but, I, but it feels very right. I suppose with the Royal Exchange, because it's very different to most theatre companies in having a team of artistic directors, yes. that the, the handover will be a little bit smoother because the other people are already there, are they? Yes, the handover started taking place slightly unbeknownst to them about a year ago when I started stepping back Uh, and of course my my colleagues at the top then I talked to and we decided just how to do it and when it should happen and so the handover will be seamless I hope. I want to take you back to how it started at the Royal Exchange and uh, well I want to go back really to when you first came to Manchester as an artistic director when you were very young, not long out of university, as artistic director of the Century which was quite, well it was a unique theatre company wasn't it? Well, it was indeed, yes. Um, I was only 22, you're right, I was very young. And well, that, this is where, where, where fate intervened. The, the Century Theatre was a touring theatre, which had its own theatre, which went around in three huge pantechnicons, and which uh, was then set up in towns which had no theatre of its own. And it was, a, it was a fully functioning auditorium and front of house. So it was like a circus arriving in town, and they usually played in a car park in Preston and Rochdale and Burnley and Rawtonstall and eventually ended up rather more beautifully, I mean, just in terms of relaxation in the Lake District for the summer in Keswick. But when I applied to become artistic director, it had just been asked to become the resident company at the University Theatre. And the University Theatre, which had been uh, masterminded by Stephen Joseph, was a fully flexible theatre. And so quite without my understanding what that would all lead to, I was very lucky to get that job at such an early age. So effectively you started off running two theatre companies, one on the road and one resident at the university. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Wasn't that um, a big thing for somebody that age, or did it not well, daunt you at that age? Yeah, when I look back, it was ridiculous. <laughs> but, the, but the fact was, it, it, just to go back a beat, uh, I, I'd had this huge success at university uh, where I had co-authored and directed a show called Hang Down Your Head and Die, which had transferred to New York and the West End. <laughs> And so I'd left university, not taking a degree, couldn't be bothered, and with immense arrogance, immense. Of course, I knew nothing, and then got several bloody noses, bloody noses, uh, taking on shows, commercial shows, which I shouldn't have done, but I had no real advice. And so one day I was phoned by Bernard Delfont, who said, I'm putting on a new musical called Passion Flower Hotel in the West End, and we'd like you to direct it. And a voice, which I later realized was mine, said, no, thank you, and put the phone down. 
And there was a copy of the stage lying by the phone, and I picked it up, and I saw this advertisement for Century Theatre. And so I answered it. And I suppose because I had a sort of whiskey profile of the time, I got it. But I went into that with equal arrogance. And I remember saying to the company, the day I took over, I'm going to turn this into a national company. And I did, actually. But that was because... I was nagging uh, Michael Ellis and Kasper Vreda, who were very distinguished directors, whose work I had seen uh, in the 59th Theatre Company um, back in the Lyric Hammersmith, and thought this is the kind of theatre I love, to come and work with me up in Manchester. And, and they were extremely kind of reticent, not surprisingly. They didn't want to work for 18 pounds a week, you know, with a 22-year-old artist director. So I cast their wives and friends. <laughs> and eventually they did come up and they brought with them on a memorable occasion uh, Tom Courtney and so the company did indeed start to have a very strong national profile through him and so by this, these strange coincidences uh, the thing grew and grew and grew to the point where Centuries yet got uncomfortable and said, well, We don't want it to be this professional and high profile, and we don't quite think this is right. At which point, Professor Hugh Hunt, who ran the Army Department at, at Manchester, said, well, well, I don't want you if you're not ambitious. I love what they're doing. And so Century Theatre went, and uh, the 69th Theatre Company was formed. That's a kind of positive version of how it all happened. <laughs> and that was you and Casper Rader and Michael Elliott initially. Yes, that's right, yes, yes. And then so you stayed on at the University Theatre for a while then? Yes, so we became the resident company there, which was a very, is and still is a very small seating capacity, and we could only play there for a very few weeks because the university were using it. But the Arts Council backed us very generously because they wanted to find out if Manchester was capable of sustaining a large repertory theatre. At that time, the library, which was under 300 seats, and I think Withenshaw had already started, were the only seats to be had in Manchester because all the other theatres were closed. The two big touring theatres were closed, etc. So we were an experiment, which lasted for a couple of years, and it was a huge success. We managed to attract uh, a lot of big names, uh, apart from, from Tom, who came back and did several shows. There was Mia Farrow, uh, and there was Vanessa Redgrave. Um, it, it, it was a very extraordinary and exciting time, uh, until uh, we were told, all right, you can have your own theatre in Manchester, which was a massive moment. And that was the Royal Exchange, was it? Yeah, well, at the beginning, we had no idea it was going to be the Royal Exchange. What we were told was, you can have a, a new theatre which will be built on a green site outside the centre. And we thought, well, that's great, but what are we going to do till then? Uh, we need to be able to produce more. So we thought we'd try and find a warehouse or a, a factory or something, rather like the Mermaid had done in London, where we could have a temporary theatre while this massive new theatre was being built somewhere, in Catchfield or somewhere, God knows where it was going to be. And so we started looking, and we didn't get very far, and then Peter Henriquez, who was a great benefactor of the company, phoned up one day and said, well, have you ever seen the Royal Exchange? And we said, mm, what's that? And he said, well, it's the, it's the old cotton exchange, but when King Cotton went into decline, uh, it closed down. You should, I'll, I'll get you in to see it. And that was an unforgettable day. We walked into this vast, what's called the biggest room in the world, and it was spine-tingling. And we thought, oh, yes, we'll put a theater up here, which we did for an extraordinarily small amount of money because we managed to get some old cinema seats from a cinema that was closing down. And Tootles gave us some materials to, to, to have a tent surround. And we opened in midwinter, <laughs> no heating, uh, issuing the audience with army blankets uh, to see the shows and packed out. And, and we stayed on there for about six months. At which point, Casper Vreda said, what earth do we want to go to a green, green site outside the centre? Let's build uh, an auditorium within this building. It will save a great deal of money. 
and it really couldn't be better situated. And so that was the moment that the 69 Theatre Company began to call itself the Royal Exchange. And then, of course, you brought in Richard Negri for the, the design of this unique well, little module. Always, he was always connected because yeah. he ran the Wimbledon uh, uh, Theatre Design School, and most of our designers came from there, and Michael and Casper had worked with him over the years at that school with different theatre shapes, hoping one day they would be allowed to build their own theatre because they, were, they didn't like the senior arts. They thought it was a dead form, and they wanted something more exciting. And so Richard was very involved with the temporary theatre, but from the moment we were, it was agreed that we could build our theatre and design it ourselves, which was also a first in this country, rather than having some civic corporation do it with architects didn't know what they were talking about. Richard started uh, uh, designing it in collaboration with the three of us, but mainly with the other two, because I was, I was very little at that time and didn't know much about it. So how did this um, design come about? I suppose if you were already basically in a tent in that big hall, the idea of closing it down like that was already there. Well, we had always worked at the University Theatre and indeed with the temporary theatre in the exchange uh, uh, with a thrust stage. So you had an audience sitting round the stage and three sides. And we assumed that that was what we were going to do. Now, Richard, who was a, a, ge- a genuine genius, the only one I think I've ever met, was also extremely eccentric and came up with all kinds of designs which seemed not to work quite. Also, we knew we had to build a theatre which would seat 750 at least to make it economically viable, so that was another problem. And if I can try and explain it, Michael, the three of them believed that the great ages of theatre were the Greek and the Elizabethan. And both in those days, each theater was based on man's relationship to the gods, which is what all great drama is really about. Uh, In the Greek theater, there was the orchestra where the chorus were, and the audience sat around that because the chorus were the audience, as it were. Then you had the skena and the stage where the kings and queens acted out, and then coming from the sky, or if you've been to Epidavros, the sea as well, came the gods. And in the Elizabethan theater, it was the globe. It was a Renaissance man who stood in the center, and there were heaven was above and hell was beneath. And in both those theaters, there was very little scenery. And the writers all wrote for that structure. Uh, and what the proscenium did, the Romans, they made it into a kind of video nasty place. They kind of shut off the audience from the stage. And, and they initially did gladiator fights up there. But the audience got cut off at that moment. And, and, and if you want to bring a god on stage in the proscenium arts, there's nowhere to bring him on from. You don't know where to do it. And so all these different designs came out of Richard. And then one day, someone, I think it was Casper, he normally was the one who understood said so we're 1970 or whatever we were there three probably we want to bring a god on where from what and someone else said well this is this is the age where about man becoming gods or recognizing the god in himself so it's got to be in the realm the god's got to come in the same room as anybody else everybody went oh yes <laughs> So it'll be a theatre in the round. He said, but, but, but we've never done anything in the round. <laughs> yes, but that's clearly it. And that's how it was born. And then the final step was Richard coming in very excitedly one day and saying, I know how to get 750 seats in without making it a huge auditorium. I've just looked on the inside of a beehive. <laughs> he said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, you build up instead of building out. So most people in the theatre will be in front rows. Which is, which is what happened. So nobody in the theatre is more than, I can't do metres, sorry, 30 feet away from the actor, no member of the audience, even though you've got 750 seats. And so you have a, a, a chamber atmosphere, but a large audience who hopefully will fit it and pay the money that's needed to keep the theatre afloat. So that's sort of a potted version of how it came into being. So at about the same time as they were building the National Theatre down in London yes. with, with the Olivier claiming to be based on a Greek theatre but where nobody could actually see the audience Obviously. opposite them, um, right. you, were, you were creating something that was, that was nearer to the, the Greek ideal, really, of a, of a community. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And interestingly, Michael Ellick was also on that board of the people that were trying to mastermind the National and gave up in despair <laughs> because, because he, he knew it was going wrong. So as a director, what uh, were you thinking when um, your theatre was going to be in the round? Were you thinking about how, how you were going to cope with that as a director? Yes, yes how on earth you do it. Uh, and in fact, what happened, because uh, they then started building the Royal Exchange, was we moved out and moved into the cathedral where we had a theatre in the round in the cathedral, where we did, I, well, I did much ado about nothing. Uh, we also did uh, a cocktail party and a couple of other things, and where we began experimenting, and, and it turned out to be beautifully easy. A lot of directors, when they think, oh, in the road, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this, but actually it's natural. People, the actors can relate naturally to each other. They don't have to move like crabs and shout very loudly to be heard out front. And so that was a very, very good preparation for what eventually became a much more sophisticated and, and wonderful space of the exchange. What about repertoire? Was any, were any guidelines laid down early on for that? Because I know you've got your own ideas. I know Greg Hersoff was interviewed for Theatre Voice and he said everything that he came up with when you interviewed him, you said they would never be seen at your theatre. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the theatre, Michael and Casper, uh, who were much, well, 14 years older than me, were very, not very happy about the theatre into which they were born, as it were. They thought it was the theatre of pessimism after the war and negativity, and therefore were very, very anxious to create a theatre which was about the possibility of moving forward and being enriched and and empowering people, which is what all great theatre is, all, all the great, great tragedies, Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, uh, Neil, you, you name them, that's what they do. However much they go into the dark of what we are, there's always a polarity. And so they rejected an awful lot of playwrights. <laughs> and they said, we don't want to do this. They also came, and by the time we opened at the Royal Exchange, James Maxwell had joined. Well, Casper was a fit. Uh, Michael was Scottish English Max was American I was Polish Russian Jewish so we had a very very wide range of European and world theatre uh, which is how Michael and Kassler made their name with the 59th Theatre Company they had done Brand the Ibsen's Brand they had done The Creditors by Strindberg etc etc so we had a repertoire which was very wide ranging but did exclude an awful lot of playwrights and I do wonder now, um, if, they, if, if they're looking on and seeing the kind of reptile these change plays now, whether they would be saying, oh, God, why are they doing that? I have no idea. But I would say that I don't particularly want to know them because I don't think it's fair, but the playwrights that Greg's talking about, we still haven't done in our theatre to this date. So um, you stuck to your guns. You've, you've kept the same sort of spirit from those early days all the way through, do you think? Totally, totally. You have to in that building. There's nothing you can do. It's like raping the space if you don't. And also, I do believe that, that, that when theatre works at its best, apart from entertaining, which it has to do, it leaves the audience going out illuminated and strengthened and feeling better. That's what one aims for. You don't always achieve it, but that's what one aims for. Every now and again, you hit the target and people write to you and you think, oh, good, that's, that's why I joined. I'm, I'm glad it's getting that kind of reception. And, and I still can't see the point of the other kind of theatre, which says life is rubbish and awful and there's really no way forward. And I find that very difficult to understand why. I mean, life is difficult enough and we should be strengthening the audience, not weakening them. So when the theatre opened in 1976, it opened yeah. with quite a high profile. You'd already been working with some real top name actors and yeah. you had some uh, big names uh, in the artistic directors. How do you think yeah. it's developed since then, the profile? What Casper and Michael always said, and they realised that we were quite narrow minded about what we were prepared to do. Casper always said, as the company gets more confident, so it will open its doors more and more and more. And that's been absolutely true. The new playwrights, I mean, the playwright that I work with, Brad Fraser, probably would never have been contemplated in those early days, for example. And quite a lot of the new plays we've done, I think wonderful plays, uh, would have looked, been looked at with a very jaundiced eye. So I think we are much more open we want to cover much more of the spectrum 
And we work on the basis that if you exclude something, it's actually going to rise against you. So the best thing is to be as inclusive as you possibly can. And that was hugely helped um, by the founding of the studio and the opening uh, up to visiting companies and allowing more experimentation with our own people because they were playwrights who you couldn't risk in the big auditorium. You can lose a fortune if you get one part of the repertoire wrong in a year. But in the studio, you could risk it. And so now I think we're a very broad church and all the better for it. Well, some of that development was brought about by the IRA bomb, which um, was something that, uh, well, it changed Manchester fundamentally and quite a lot of it in the end for the better. But how did it change the Royal Exchange? Well, you're absolutely right. I was sitting in London uh, uh, when it happened at a meeting with architects because we were putting in for a lottery grant at the time to refurbish the theatre. And when I was finally told, because initially nobody was quite sure what damage had been done, the famous remark with our executive director then, Pat Weller, phoned me and said, I'm afraid we're going to lose the matinee. Um, (laughs) That that was an understatement. Um, but, But then she phoned two days later and said, get up here. Uh, we may never reopen again. Uh, we're all hiding out in the library theatre or looking after us. You've got to get up. And I thought as I came up on the train, this is fantastic. We're going to be given a great deal of money. We're not going to have to worry about box office for a couple of years because that's always the nightmare. This is great. And I was able to walk in and people were very shell-shocked and say, I don't know what you're upset about. This is going to be fantastic. Because the theatre needed a facelift. When we opened, we just about had enough money to do the auditorium. The offices were cramped. The, all the backstage areas were cramped. We had a tiny workshop. And I suddenly thought, my goodness me, we will be able to make the auditorium even better, clean up the grand foyer, which was filthy. I mean, people never looked up above shoulder height because it was, it was covered in gloom and dust and muck. And so I, I thought it was very exciting. The first big challenge, because uh, we had a production with an American director of Philadelphia Story, 10 days from opening. And what we managed to do was to pull in our mobile theater, which was touring around with... Uh, the Marx Brothers, it had the Animal Crackers, which was so wonderful, and get it into Castlefield with the great help of the Manchester City Council, Howard Bernstein, and open on time, which was very exciting. And also, it told us a bit about what we needed to do in the theatre, because it was such an egalitarian place in Castlefield. It was lovely to be. And it was very relaxing for everybody. And so in terms of the studio and all those things, because the studio came about because of a bomb, we couldn't have had it before. And being able to have wonderful workshops about five minutes walk from the theatre and put the studio where the workshops had been. It was a huge liberation, as I think it was, for Manchester. It made it into a, into a thriving great city, which is just amazing. I mean, unfortunately, Kerry Adams didn't blow up the Arndale Centre. I did write in the paper to come back and finish it off. But apart from that, it was incredibly positive with the miracle that nobody was killed even though it went off that bomb at 10.30 on a Saturday morning, which is extraordinary. So now we've come 35 years since um, the Royal Exchange opened. Mm. Where's it going to go next, do you think? Well, it's evolving all the time. And uh, I can't tell you all the plans uh, because they haven't been announced yet and contracts have been signed. But I think if you look, for example, at the fact that we're collaborating with Told by an Idiot, a Christmas, of the Christmas show. I think we're looking outwards more. We're seeing people with different disciplines, different areas of theatre that we would like to collaborate with, which we would find enriching. You'll find uh, the Bruntwood competition, which was a huge success last year, is burgeoning and is going to further develop our whole new playwriting side, which I think is very exciting. And, well, there are, there are a couple of very, very high-profile projects with people that do not normally work work with us, but who we admire hugely, which will be coming up in the next couple of years, which will mean, I think, that we're providing an even greater service, not just to the community, but to the theatre community. So I hope that's, uh, that's going to be the way it's going to go. You've sometimes had a bit of a, a mixed relationship with the critics, with some in particular. <laughs> you mentioned in your book, well, they said, Alan Hume gets an entry... Oh. <laughs> he gets an entry in the index for your uh, your autobiography oh. just just so you can say that um, he spent twenty five years trying to uh, do the Royal Exchange down. Do you, do you really believe that some were that much against you? 
I think he did. You know, I know he I absolutely know he did. I wrote half a page. I remember in the Manchester Evening News saying these people must go now. <laughs> and when I confronted him uh, at a certain stage, he admitted he hated theatre in the round and didn't understand why we weren't doing certain playwrights who he loved. And I said, because we wouldn't do them here. I said, there are other things in Manchester doing, but we're not going to do those playwrights. But I think he took that very personally, and particularly me for some reason. <laughs> but it was negativity. And famously, there was a letter written to the Manchester Evening News saying, I'm absolutely furious. Um, I've just read a bad review by Alan Hume for, for a play at the uh, Palace. So I naturally assumed it would be very good and went to it, and it was bad. Uh, yes, I think he did. I really do think he did. And I think in the early days, there were other critics who were very anti us, who slowly got one round, because we were very outspoken, and people were accused us of arrogance, etc., etc., etc. And I mean, Michael Elliott, you know, turned down uh, number two at the National Theatre, taking over the Royal Court, running BBC Two drama to be there. And he was very outspoken. But it did, I think, tend to sound like these people think they know what it's all about and nobody else does. And I think that, that riled people in the early days. But slowly it all calmed down and I think, uh, I think we won out. And I think now, I think our relationship with the press is pretty good. Yes, no, I mean, definitely Alan was like that, and everybody knew he was. That was the kind of extraordinary thing, and you just thought, oh, God, for goodness sake, what's the point? Still, on a more positive. he didn't manage it. He didn't manage it. <laughs> on a more positive note, though, looking back yes. over the last 35 years, what what's, yes. do you remember that you're most proud of? Well, apart from uh, the recovery from the bomb, which uh, was a very proud moment when we reopened in Castlefield, it was, and I remember Howard Bernstein saying this is a symbol of Manchester, how it's fighting back so quickly. It was a kind of, I just felt, oh, this whole company's done very well. It's built a theater and catering and dressing rooms and all in 10 days with, with, with the show rehearsing. That's a great moment, um, and therefore, when it reopened again at the Royal Exchange, I was very proud of that. Uh, apart from that, it's, it, it's the productions uh, uh, that one remembers over the years, both my own and other people's, who I thought uh, did what, what we were setting out to do. They, they were great moments. I mean, the, the latest production, The View from the Bridge, uh, when I sat and watched that, I thought, oh... I'm leaving them in good hands. <laughs> right. you know, but, that, but that's obviously the production of the point. So what's next for you then? I know you've got um, the, the big musical production, the big collaboration coming up that we know about, but uh, generally, right. what, if, what are you planning to do? Well, that takes me through till the summer. Yeah. But yes, I am, and I can't tell you in America, I've been, I'm being commissioned to write the libretto and direct a, a, a new opera. Uh-huh with Todd McAver, because I've done two operas with him, one in Houston and one up at the Sage. I can't, it's in America, but we haven't signed the contract yet, so they'd kill me if I said where it was, because they <laughs> want to get the publicity. So that is definitely happening. And uh, I'm amazed, one or two people have already phoned um, about commercial productions and so on and so forth. Uh, and I've got a, a, a second book coming out in the autumn about directing, and a third book in my mind. And I think now I can only do, uh, and what's going to be interesting is one of the reasons why I became an artistic director in the first place, because I didn't have to do any productions I didn't want to do. (laughs) Um, One could choose. And uh, what I don't want to do is to suddenly think, well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that because I'm a freelance. Um, I want to choose, but I certainly want to go on directing. I certainly would like to come back to the Royal Exchange to direct. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, And as I say, use the energies of the left to do that. That was theatre director Brian Murray OBE, who died in July 2018 at the age of 75. He did write two books, his autobiography, The Worst It Can Be as a Disaster, published by Matthew and Drama, and How to Direct, published by Oberon Books. The Royal Exchange continued under joint artistic directors Greg Hersov and Sarah Frankham until Hersov stepped down in 2014 for Frankham to become the theatre's first ever sole artistic director. She has announced that she will be leaving the company in 2019. For more information about the Royal Exchange, see www.royalexchange.co.uk. You've been listening to a podcast from British Theatre Guide. For more information, please visit britishtheatreguide.info.